Jim, we're here at the FQXI conference, beautiful area, talking about the physics of the observer. Uh, this goes back, the concept of an observer, a hundred years or so uh, to the, the original days of quantum mechanics and Niels Bohr and Copenhagen. Uh, why are we still talking about this after a hundred years? Um, Copenhagen quantum mechanics is probably the most successful theoretical framework in the history of physics. It explains why the sun shines, why you don't interpenetrate your <laughs> chairs, atoms, and fall onto the floor. Michael Turner, when he was director of the NSF, used to claim that quantum mechanics was responsible for 85% of the US GDP. Yeah. Transistors, electronics, and, sure. and so forth. So it's a very important subject, but it had a limited range of uh, experience. It aimed at predicting the probabilities for outcomes of measurements that were made by external observers. Right? Therefore, defining what you meant exactly by a measurement or an observer became an important problem, right? Because you could, ex if you had one measurement, you could expand the scope to include one observer, but then you had to have another observer looking at that one uh, to discuss. Uh, and that attempt to define those things carefully, I think, um, I think never succeeded. It was an irreversible act of amplification of measurement, right? But how much did the entropy go, go up? It was making a record, an indelible record, but how long did it have to last? It was making contact with macroscopic variables, like we used to describe uh, the situation here. But what exactly was macroscopic? It was just as fuzzy as it was uh, before. Most importantly, it obviously can't um, apply to the universe as a whole quantum mechanics of the universe as a whole, because What's the by internal? definition, there's nothing outside right. looking at it. So since Everett in 57, I think, there has been a chain of expanding the views of quantum mechanics in several directions. First, larger, so that the observer was, whatever observers were, were described inside the system, right, uh, by the quantum mechanics of the whole closed system. Secondly, it was an expansion in time. There were no observers in the early universes for quantum you know, No measurements being carried out. Uh, do we believe that quantum mechanics some does, somehow doesn't apply there? That's I think the answer is obviously no. In fact, there's a consider some evidence, at least, that it does apply in those scales. So we needed a new quantum mechanics um, that was preserve the idea of quantum mechanical phenomena, uncertainty, and so forth. And that was gradually developed. Um, and I think um, the one I participated in is called consistent or decoherent histories. Uh, and it's a framework which is, I believe, generally accepted for doing cosmology, and in which Copenhagen quantum mechanics is not wrong. It's contained within that expanded framework as an approximation that is appropriate when you're doing measurements, when you actually have observers. Okay, let's look at this. Um, in terms of the early universe, you could um, enlarge or broaden your definition of observer by saying any kind of interaction. So it doesn't have to be a sentient observer. You can have a, uh, some type of an interaction affecting the system and therefore causing the decoherence. None uh, of you? In my opinion, that isn't profitable because it's too speculative, I mean, too special. Uh, it, uh, there are many other things going on in the universe that, that aren't described but simply if, if you, you can't, can't say an observation is merely an interaction. After all, the, the former people thought it was much more special than that. Yes. It was creation right. of a record. Right. You can make a case sort of the creation, for the creation of a record as a way of formulating you know, quantum mechanics, but it has to be a much more general notion of record. So it, they, it, do I understand correctly that your view that the concept of an observer is now no longer necessary because you have this enlarged framework in which uh, uh, the wave function is uh, that doesn't have to decohere. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Right. Uh, the reason is because we seek in cosmology to predict probability for observations that are made by measurements, uh, by observers, by us, for example, and therefore we have to be able to describe measurements, observers, and so forth. Uh, but it's a derivative in, concept. Right. In the context of this larger 
Okay. Why now, do I understand the larger vi view that you have that it, that needs to make this system work mm -hmm. is the many worlds theory? Uh, I think it's a, an extension, uh, and to some extent a completion I, I mean, of the you, program that ever started you, you certainly um, can we, solve a problem, mm -hmm. but isn't the, the uh, isn't the, um, uh, the the solution to the problem creating a bigger problem than the original one? To some people, yes. <laughs> to me, no. So you have this multiplicity of worlds. Uh, I, I don't even know how to calculate how many of them happen every second with with, uh, with, with, with quantum wave functions of every particle in the universe somehow interrelating with each other, creating uh, uh, each one their own kind of uh, um, conjoined probability of all of these things. It, 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 just, it, just, it just seems incredible uh, to, to, to have that. It, 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 the, the burden of this enormous structure of reality to solve what seems to be a, a little bit of a puzzle <laughs> it's just it just seems in, in, inconsistent um so uh we don't talk that way right <laughs> first of all there aren't wave functions for every particular subsystem right now you don't have a wave function right because you're not in a uh, pure state precisely People because of what, that, what yeah. you said you're interacting right. every millisecond a large number of photons scattered off you and uh, left the smallest system is already 10 light seconds uh, in size that's isolated. Yeah. So th those systems don't, they, uh, don't, aren't really isolated. They're all part of one thing. And they don't, certainly don't have individual wave functions. Right? So, but the formalism of quantum mechanics. Now, let's get back to the different worlds. We think a better, Gilman and I thought this, a better way of looking at them was that there are different possible histories of uh, the world. You could have sat here, or you could have sat over here. That's an alternative set of histories. And we could calculate the probabilities, starting from the one-wave function for the whole universe, of whether you did this or that. So to my view, that's a simplification. You can, of course, make it arbitrarily. And typically in the universe, we're interested in what are called very coarse-grained descriptions. Not you, not the person filming, right? But um, not the details of this river, but very big things like how big was, did the universe get? Or how much microwave background uh, radiation does it have in? Things that we can actually measure and test the theory. In principle, of course, we could have an arbitrarily, almost arbitrarily fine-grained set of histories that would describe you, but it would be, I think what you're suggesting, it would be incredibly complex right, for the to calculate. Yes. So we make approximations to calculate, and one of those approximations is Copenhagen quantum mechanics.